full realization of hearing for his guru. At that time, Vedavyas sat down and he compiled the cream of all Vedic literatures, the Bhagavad Purana, the Sriman Bhagavatam, which is the essence of the purest conception of the Absolute Truth. And in the second verse of Bhagavad, Vedavyas explains, Dharma Projita Kaita Matra Parma Niramat Saranam Sata Vedya Mastad Mastad Sudhu Sitaran Thabak Dhyayom Nubula Srimad Bhagavate Mahamune Kute Vite Kimma Paraya Vishwara He describes that this Bhagavatam from the very beginning kicks out all cheating principles of religion kicks out any religious principle which is selfishly motivated for one's own sense gratification. <coughs> it deals exclusively with pure devotion to God. Krishna says in Gita, Bahunam Janmana Mante Jnanavam Mampapadyate Vasudeva Sarvamiti Samahatma Sudhuva After many births and deaths, when one finally comes to the point of knowledge, he surrenders to Vasudev, knowing him to be the cause of all causes and all that is. So does Vasudev Saravamiti Samahat Vasudeva. Such a great soul is very rare. This is what is exclusively taught in the Shrimad Bhagavatam. And after compiling Bhagavatam, Veda Vyas considered that now my mission has been complete. Now I am satisfied. Not only that, by hearing the Bhagavatam, I am feeling transcendental ecstasy. Veda Vyasa had a son who was in the womb of his mother. And what type of son would be born from someone like Vyasadeva? Not an ordinary boy. His child's name was Shukadeva. And he was Brahman realized from his very birth, from his very conception. <coughs> While in the womb of his mother, he was experiencing Brahmananda, the ecstasy of the spiritual platform of life. So he was thinking, I am content wherever I am. In this world, especially Kali Yuga is just coming, in this world, there are so many distractions, there are so many temptations, there are so many crazy, crazy people who do not understand anything about the goal of life. Why should I bother with all these things? I'm happy sitting here in the womb of my mother. I will remain here. I will live my whole life in the womb of my mother. I will not have to deal with the distractions. I will not have to risk my spiritual sanity with all the temptations of this world, and I will be happy. So he was very happy, living in this dark, torturous womb of his mother, because he was experiencing the bliss within his heart. Krishna says in Gita that a wise man, he is illumined from within, he is enlightened within, he rejoices within, and he finds unlimited pleasure within. Whatever situation you're in, whether you're physically handicapped, whether you're old, whether the whole world is against you, whether you go bankrupt in your business, whether everyone is criticizing you and mistreating you and misjudging you, or whether you're young, healthy, handsome, wealthy, wise, and very popular. Whatever condition, if you are experiencing the wealth the treasure of bliss from within, then you remain undisturbed. Krishna describes how this is possible. He says that just as there is an ocean, and in that ocean is flowing many rivers. 
Sometimes in the rainy season, the rivers are miles wide, flooding in all directions. And millions and billions of liters of water are flowing into the ocean in every minute. And sometimes in the summer season, the rivers dry up to practically nothing, and there's hardly anything coming into the ocean. Is the ocean disturbed by whatever the rivers are bringing? Because of the depth and the volume of the water of the ocean, although it is first perfectly cognizant of what's coming in, it's undisturbed. So similarly, when one is experiencing the infinite ocean of happiness within our own hearts, which is the very nature of the soul, the consciousness within us, that whatever rivers come through our senses, whether it be happiness, distress, honor, dishonor, pleasure, pain, heat, cold, good, bad, doesn't disturb us. We deal with it, we understand what's going on, we do the, need, we do the needful, but we are above all this. We are transcendental. So Shukadeva Goswami was like that. Therefore, he was quite happy living his life in the womb of his mother. He remained there for 16 years. This may sound impossible, but understand he was a great yogi. And understand this was an age when people were much more powerful than today. You can imagine his mother Ah. Most of you mothers, you understand, when it starts getting seven months, eight months, nine months, you're thinking, my God, when will this creature come out? <laughs> ah, when will it stop torturing me? It becomes very... I just, I've never gone through it myself. <laughs> it appears that it becomes very heavy and it starts moving around and kicking and punching and everything. Ah, you're thinking, when will it come out? And the husband is thinking, my God, please, when will that day be? What do you think, Mother Jesus? It's a painful experience, I think. It's a very troublesome experience. Can you imagine, ah, how old are you, Sachina? Fifteen, and he's very small. He'll be bigger when he's sixteen. Can you imagine him in your womb? Huh? And when he starts kicking and punching, my God, you get very restless. So Veda Vyasa's mother was sitting there with a 16-year-old boy in her womb. Not to speak of the embarrassment. Every woman is proud of her thin waist. <laughs> so Veda Vyasa. He was very anxious that his son come out. Because he had a mission for his son. He was his only son. There was no chance of having another son <laughs> until he came out. <laughs> so he was begging this child, come out! Shukadev Goswami was Oh, um, he was very happy. No reply. So at that time, Veda Vyas began to narrate the transcendental pastimes of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Sri Krishna. He began to recite the Srimad Bhagavatam. At that time, Shukadev Goswami became so attracted to this divine literature and hearing it ah, that the bliss of Brahman, Brahmananda, became insignificant to him. He had already attained the state of mukti, but to him mukti was just insignificant and distasteful compared to the sweetness of hearing the sound vibration of Krishna's names and glories. So at that time, Shukadeva Goswami came out of the womb to relish the highest nectar 
of the ecstasy of hearing Srimad Bhagavatam from his father. It is described in the second chapter of the first canto of Bhagavatam what is the supreme goal of life for all living beings. Sabaipum Sangharo Dharma Yato Bhaktira Bhokshuja Ahoyta Ki Aprati Hata Yajatma Suprasita The supreme occupation for all humanity is that which brings one to that point of unmotivated, uninterrupted, loving, devotional service to the Lord. Only when we attain this pure devotion to God can we be completely satisfied with our hearts. We may have many occupations, what we call dharma. So how do we adjust so that within our life we are pursuing the Supreme Dharma? Krishna says, Sarva Dharma Pradityas Jama Vekam He says, abandon all other varieties of Dharma and just surrender to me. So most people think this is very impractical. Right now I'm a businessman. Or I'm a doctor. Or I'm a lawyer. Or I'm an industrialist. Or I'm a student. Or I'm a farmer, or an accountant, or a housewife, or a stockbroker. It is not practical for me with a family, a wife, to give up these things, to surrender to God. We may think, but how can one be a doctor and at the same time be a sadhu? Is it possible? How can one be a businessman dealing with rupees and prices all day and be saintly? How can one be a housewife and sit cleaning the house and preparing food and be saintly? How can one be a farmer on his hands and knees, dirty as anything all day long, dealing with the ground, the soils, and at the same time abandon all varieties of religion and surrender to Krishna? This is a question many people ask when they consider what it means to be a religious person. Now of all occupations, what appears to be the most absolutely contrary to being a sadhu? Generally you think of a sadhu as someone who is very peaceful, very equal-posed, who just has renounced everything except contemplation and meditation on the divine. From the farthest reaches of your imagination, the most contradictory conception of having an occupation and being a sadhu is to be a warrior. Huh? Where you're on the battlefield killing hundreds and thousands of people, cutting off their heads, cutting off their arms, huh? making all their wives widows. Huh? But Bhagavad Gita was spoke to a warrior to teach him how to be a sadhu, a saint, 
how to abandon all varieties of religion and occupation and surrender to Krishna and at the same time maintain his responsibilities. He didn't have one wife, but he had three wives. And he had many children. And he was about to fight a war where he was expected to kill hundreds of thousands of men. And Krishna was telling him, if you want to be a saint, you cannot leave this battlefield. You must do your duty, you must fight. But, you must fight in pure consciousness. You must fight for me. Whatever you do, Krishna said, whatever you eat, whatever you offer and give away, you do it as an offering to me. Do not be attached to success or failure, honor or dishonor, happiness or distress. Yehi samsparashita bhoga, dukha jonai. Do not be attached to the objects of the senses, but do your duty as an act of loving devotional service to the Supreme God. Manmana bhava mad bhakto nam namaskur. You fight, but you always think of me. You be my devotee. You worship me and offer your homage unto me. In this way, through the discharge of your duty, you will come to me without fail. If Arjuna could be a killer on the battlefield, and be a perfect son, a perfect saint, be a totally surrendered soul to Krishna, then surely it is not very difficult for us to do the same thing as a doctor or a lawyer or a businessman or an accountant or a housewife or a student or any occupation in life. Factually, living a religious and a purely spiritual life is the most practical life we can live. People think that it's impractical to mix religion with one's daily activities or responsibilities in this world. Some people are so, so lamentably unfortunate that they have fallen into the deepest abyss of illusion to think <clears throat> that they have so many responsibilities in this world they do not have time to cultivate spiritual consciousness. Such person's intelligence has been completely stolen away by illusion. Garga Upanishad says, Yova etad aksharam gargi avrit lashmao praiti sukripana. He is a miserly man who takes this rare human birth and leaves his body like the cats and dogs without understanding self-realization. Human life is meant for that purpose. The other evening I was in New Delhi and they arranged a very beautiful program in a very nice pandal in a very wealthy man's yard and many, several hundred people attended. And the son of this man who arranged this program, he was a college student, and he had a question. He said, I was reading one book, and it was describing that some people are living and some people are existing. Can you explain the difference between the two? Huh? So what is the difference between existing and living? The animals are existing. The trees are existing. The plants are existing. Why? Because they are simply living according to the impulses of their mind and senses. Essentially, they are eating, they are sleeping, they are mating, and they are defending. 
therefore, through eating, sleeping, mating, and defending, preserving their bodies, simply acting according to the immediate impulses of the mind and senses, they are existing. <coughs> Now, human life is meant for something more than that. Human life is meant to choose, to discriminate, and to pursue the ultimate goal of life. And if a human being is not doing that, he has not graduated from the animal platform of consciousness. The only difference between a human being and, as an, and an animal is religion. There's no other difference. A human being can question his existence and pursue something beyond what the senses perceive. Who am I? Where am I going? What is the goal of life? Who is God? What is my relationship? Why am I suffering? What is after death? When we ask these questions, our human life begins. Until we ask these questions and pursue the realization of the answer to these questions, we are animals, simply eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. We may think that we are better than the animals, but in quality we are not. Quantitatively we are, but qualitatively we are not. Just like we are very proud that we have a very big, beautiful home with a very beautiful bed that we can sleep in. Huh? But the dogs and cats on the street, they're sleeping as well. The bird has a nest, which is just the perfect arrangement for him to sleep with his family. Huh? The spider has his web, which is just the perfect arrangement for him to sleep with his family. They're perfectly satisfied with their sleeping condition. The snake has his hole in the ground where he goes to go to sleep with his family. Then we have our big, big house or apartment and our nice bedstead. And we sleep. And when we sleep, we enjoy no better pleasure than the snake or the spider or the dogs and the cats. So we are spending so much energy to have some big house, but the animals are doing the same thing. In fact, the animals can enjoy sleeping better than you. The bear can go to sleep for six months at a time. How long can you sleep? Even when you want to sleep, as long as you can, then you start waking up, and then you have to take sleeping pills, and then it wears off, and you wake up, and you have to face the world, and you think, my God, I want to sleep. If your standard of happiness is sleeping, then you will be happier as a bear, because bears are better at sleeping than you. What about sex? In the Western world, sex is very important. Of course, India has, what, 600, 700 million people, so 800 million people, so sex is quite obviously quite significant here also. Uh -huh. But in the West, it is very uncontrolled, and most people consider that it is the goal of life. I speak very frankly as one who has lived there, that it is not uncommon that a person considers a man great by how much sex he can have. Just like you go to the movies to see someone on, in the cinema, and usually the hero has sex at least five or six times, right in front of your eyes, within two hours, huh? before the movie's finished. And you think, ah, I want to be like him. Such power, such potency. How many times can a man have sex? At the most, five or six times in a day. And then his body is completely exhausted. Now the pigeons, they can have sex 60 times in a day. And still, ah, they're full of energy, ready for more. 
Pigeons are better than human beings when it comes to these things. We have our family. But the, but the hogs also have their family. So simply having a family and having sex is no improvement from the animals. We may be more sophisticated, but the nature is the same. What about eating? Ah, we may eat very, very fine foods cooked by the best cooks. Ah, the tiger is eating a deer. The dog is eating the garbage in the street. The bird is eating the worm. The satisfaction is the same. And defending, we are building big, big bombs. We have all kinds of security devices. The tiger has his claws and teeth. The dog has his dog teeth. Just like in this world today, we find Russia and America. They have these big, 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 big bombs. And they consider themselves very, very advanced in civilization because they have these huge bombs. What is the mentality of having these bombs? Did you ever see two dogs in the street fighting over a bone? Huh? What do they do? They show their teeth at one another. They show their claws to one another. They start growling. And one trying to scare the other one so that the other one gets the bone. First they just try to scare, scare, scare. And if the scaring doesn't work, they bite, they scratch. Huh? <coughs> it's dog life. I have bigger teeth than you. So I get the bone. No, I have bigger teeth. I have bigger teeth. I have bigger teeth. Huh? Here are the two most advanced nations in the world, materially, technologically. And they're spending most of their gross national income in building bombs, over one billion dollars a day for each of those nations. And what are they doing with these big bombs? We are so advanced, we are so civilized. They're simply like dogs. Arr, look at my missiles. Arr. Well, I have bigger missiles. Arr. Well, I have bigger missiles. Ruff, ruff, ruff. Well, I have better submarines. Ruff, ruff, ruff. They're just trying to scare each other. And eventually they start... <laughs> it's just the human version of... Ruff, ruff, ruff. <coughs> I'm not a very good dog. <laughs> Dogs are better at growling than humans. <laughs> Understand, human advancement is no better than animal civilization in quality. The only thing that differentiates the human being from the animal is the human being can realize the eternal nature of the soul. The human being can liberate himself from all sufferings. The human being can find eternal peace and eternal life in loving devotion to God. <coughs> and if a human being doesn't utilize his life for that purpose, <coughs> but he uses it simply to live a sophisticated animal existence, he never really learns how to live. He simply existed his whole life through. So Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam are teaching us the most practical and realistic way to live in this world. Not to neglect our responsibilities to our job, to our family, to our nation, but never to, to neglect our responsibilities to our Supreme Creator and Father, God. So how to do it? The scriptures explain, and these sadhus explain. 
And if we consult the scriptures and, ex and consult those great saints who have imbibed the essence of the scriptures in their lives and in their teachings, then it becomes a very tangible and practical way of life to live the highest occupation of devotion to God. It is described, work is not worship unless it is done in devotion to God. So how can we transform our worship, our work, into worship? It is very easy. We simply have to establish God within our heart. This life, this is a home. It is a very nice home. When the deity of God is established within the home, and we accept that this home is God's home. Power on earth could kick you out. Huh? But at the time of death, you are kicked out. That means this house is not yours. This body is not yours. This family is not yours. Because you do not have supreme control over these things. Everything is the property of God. Bhoktaram Jagatapa Samsara To simply accept and recognize that fact is the beginning of religion. If everything is the property of God, then everything is to be utilized in His service. So by accepting that myself, my family, we are all here living in God's house and we are all His servant. I go to work. Why do I work? For money. Let's face it, everyone works for money. If you did not get paid, would you go to work tomorrow? <coughs> it's not bad to work for money. It's good to work for money. If you use your money for the right thing. If you use your money for sinful purposes, then your work is sinful. If you work, use your money for pious purposes, your work is pious. If you use your money in consciousness of God and in the service of God, then your work is yoga. Your work is dharma. Your work is the perfection of life. So if you accept that your home is God's home, and you are worshiping and glorifying God as a family, then you're, when you pay the rent, you are doing service to God. When you buy your food and you offer it to God, then all that money being utilized to buy food is service to God, directly. And of course, then you take the prasad and distribute it to your family and become purified. In other words, our consciousness is the most important factor in our life. Not what we do, but how we do it. You are watching Mahabharata on the television. Most everybody, I'm sure. Very soon, the battle of Kurukshetra will begin on this television series. And you will find the Kurus and the Pandavas 